the holy word of God. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall, not, shall never be moved. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Um, today we have Pastor Min from New Life Presbyterian Church in Fullerton. Um, please welcome him with, uh, you know, with a loving heart. <laughs> Good morning, church. Uh, wow, you guys respond. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, I gotta say, uh, I was so blessed um, worshiping with your covenant kids. And uh, uh, just to give you a quick background of my, uh, my life, I grew up most of my life in Chicago. And the previous church that I, I pastored before moving out to California three years ago, uh, it was a very similar uh, context of kids worshiping with us. And it just blessed my heart to hear the kids sing and worshiping and them knowing the songs and raising their hand. I mean, it was, I, I was truly blessed. Uh, and it's an uh, encouragement to you all uh, to keep doing what you've been doing uh, in raising up our covenant kids uh, in the Lord. Um, as mentioned, I am a family and community life pastor at New Life uh, Presbyterian Church in Fullerton. I've been there three years, uh, but I grew up in Chicago. Anybody from here, um, from Chicago area? Anybody? Yeah, you Californians never leave. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of my church members uh, think Chicago is East Coast. Some of you guys think that. Uh, let me uh, refresh your geography a little bit. It's Midwest, not uh, East Coast. East Coast would be New York. Um, and I could, I could understand why, because you guys, it, this is a beautiful place to live. Uh, and I could see why you guys uh, never live, uh, leave uh, outside of this state. Uh, but I uh, came three years ago, and it's been a blessing uh, experience for our family. I have three boys, uh, 16, 14, 12. It was a traumatic experience for my boys moving out to California. In fact, uh, my oldest, uh, he was eighth grade at that time, hated me, uh, told me every day he hated me. Uh, and now he loves it, and I asked him uh, uh, recently about, you know, if you were to do all of it over again in light of the hardship that you had, uh, would you do it again? He said, yeah, Dad. Uh, so praise God. Uh, he doesn't hate me anymore. Uh, and uh, we're so thankful to be out here, and I'm so thankful to uh, be worshiping with you all this morning. Uh, I just want to begin with a story uh, or an incident that happened about a month ago. Uh, I was driving not too far from here in La Habra. As soon as it turned, I live in Brea. I was going to Costco, and then as soon as I crossed over to La Habra, uh, I received a ticket for being on my phone. Now, before some of you judge me, let me uh, plead my case uh, before you. Uh, in fact, when I told my wife when I came home about my ticket, uh, instead of comforting me, she said, you deserve it. I told you not to be on your phone. Uh, and that may be some of you here uh, as you're hearing this. Uh, but in my defense, I thought as long as you're not driving, an operating uh, moving vehicle that it was okay for you to use your phone. Maybe you guys knew that or not. Uh, but that was my defense when the officer pulled me over and said, do you know why you got pulled over? Uh, and I thought maybe it was for other things like tinted windows, not having a front license plate, which I also got a warning for and a ticket. Uh, but he said, no, it's because you were on your phone. And I said, Off officer, uh, it was a red light. I wasn't driving and he said, very annoyed uh, at my response. He said, it doesn't matter if you were driving or not. You cannot touch your phone if you are in the vehicle. Yeah, I see some uh, elbow pointing here uh, telling uh, people to pay attention to. Uh, and I was thinking about that because although I pleaded ignorance in my defense, 
Just because you are ignorant of the law does not negate you violating the law. And here in Psalm 15, we get a clear picture of the righteous requirement that God demands from all of us. In fact, we read about it in our uh, confession uh, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, where the perfect obedience that God demands from all of his people in the covenant stipulation that he has laid out for us as his people to perfectly obey is something that we don't really think about. Because why? So often in our context today, we hear about God's grace being preached a lot. And in fact, if we have to lean on one side, I would say we need to preach the grace that is found in the good news of the gospel. But we also forget, as we hear grace often, is that grace is always in the context of the bad news that we are often forgetting. And that's what David pictures for us as he lays out the question of who can dwell in God's holy presence as he lists out all of the qualifications and demands that is needed for us to be with him. So as we go through the text in Psalm 15, my prayer is that the good news of the gospel that we find in Psalm 15 can not only encourage our hearts, but it could motivate us in living our holy lives for him. So there are three uh, sections that we will uh, uncover first. First, a question that David asks in verse 1, and then 2, we'll look at all the qualification that he lists out for us, and then the promise that he gives in verse 5. Uh, so first, question 1, who can dwell in the presence of God? This is how David begins here in this text. Who shall sojourn in your tent, and who shall dwell on your holy hill? It's asking the question, who is worthy to be in the presence of God? And it's a question that we don't usually think about, but old covenant believers went through this when it comes to being in God's presence. Because when David begins with the question, who shall sojourn in your tent, the specific use of the word sojourn and tent was no doubt associating the Old Testament sacrificial system that was involved in worship. The tent or the tabernacle, a portable sanctuary that was used by the Israelites, was a dwelling place of God. And in order for you to be in his presence, there were all of these requirements that were needed. In fact, when you look at the building of the tabernacle in Exodus 25 and 31, you understand the seriousness of how God wanted you to approach his presence. So when David is asking the question, as he begins in verse 1, he wants the people to think about just what it takes for us as God's invited guests to dwell in his presence. In fact, he asks, that is often done in Hebrew poetry, to use a a similar question that may seem like a a, a repetitive thing that is being done here, but it's actually done with a purpose to reiterate and highlight the fact that who is worthy to dwell in God's presence. And as we begin, the question I have for us is, is that something that you desire in your life? Do you desire to be here at this place? at this moment? Do you desire to have a relationship with God? And for some of us that have been coming to church for a while, sometimes worship can be a place of obligation and duty as something that we just have to do. But if that's some of us, we just come out of habit, ask yourself, do I desire to be here? Do I desire to worship and to be with him and to enjoy him forever? And if there's no desire in your heart, then it's okay to be honest and plead with the Lord that you may have that desire in your heart. Because there's nothing that you need to deal with that is more important than what David is posing here in verse 1. Because it's about ultimately your standing with God and you being with him, dwelling with him forever. So that's the question that David begins. Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? Well, he goes on to list the qualifications of a person that he approves to be in his presence. And I'm just going to kind of divide it into four uh, broad categories. First, the character of a person, speech of a person that God approves, conduct, and value. So character, speech, conduct, and value. 
So character of a person that God approves, that could dwell in his presence. In verse 2, he says, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right. That word blameless in the Hebrew word means that which is whole or sound. It's referring to a person whose character is well morally uh, grounded. This person is not just good in one area and has skeletons that are hidden, but someone who walks blameless uh, in all aspects of life. It's a person of character and integrity who is consistently, constantly pursuing a blameless life in all areas of life. Not only that, it's described as the word walk, which emphasized the everyday activity of a person. And in this case, the everyday activity of a person who is of character is someone who is pursuing godliness and blamelessness which means it's more than just duty or rules, focus, ethic, but it's a character-shaped life that David is pointing out here in this text. Not only that, second thing that's related to being blameless is someone who is consistent in his character in doing what is right. This is someone who not only knows what the right thing is, but someone who does the right thing. I mean, think about how often we find ourselves having difficulty in doing the right thing. Is it because we don't know what the right thing is? Or is it because we don't want to do the right thing? It's not a matter of not knowing, but actually doing. And this is where James talks about the consistency between what we profess and how we live. And he says in 2.14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Do we show our faith by our works in the way that we are living? Are we who we say we are by the way we live out our lives and doing the right thing or simply saying that's what I believe? David Brooks, a uh, New York Times columnist and an author in his book, uh, The Road to Character, writes about the importance in differentiating the difference between uh, resume virtue or eulogy virtue. Now, resume virtues are the ones that you put on your resume, which are skills and traits that you bring to the table. And eulogy virtues are the ones that are mentioned in your funeral. And usually those are related to who you are, your character. And at the end of the day, we know that character is what matters. Yet, if we're honest, isn't it tempting for us to focus more on what is seen rather than what is unseen? Isn't it easier for us to be tempted to identify ourselves in the things that we do and what people recognize us for in the traits and skills and competency rather than what David is pointing out, which is the inner character development of someone who pursues godliness and blamelessness in all areas of life? What do you care about more in your life at this moment? Character, although at times unseen and unrecognized, is what God is reminding us that we need to care about, that we are to walk in. Second thing that we see is a speech of a person that God approves in verse 2. Not only does he talk about walking blameless and doing what is right, but he says, speaks truth in his heart who does not slander with his tongue. Now, this word truth, although in, includes this idea of what is correct and uh, accurate, uh, but I think the emphasis here is beyond just telling what is correct, but truth as something that you could count on being trustworthy. So this person is not someone who not only speaks the truth, but a person whom you could trust. Speech isn't just what is said, but it's a reflection of a person's character. And this is clarified further as a description says, this person speaks truth in his heart, which means what comes out is consistent with his character and what is within. This person is not duplicitous, as what is said is what he believes. And how important is it for us as believers to hold on to uh, this uh, truth-telling as our character and who we are? As often what we see is not what is described here in this text. But does that describe the way you talk with one another here at Hope of Glory? Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Then in verse 4.15 says, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up, which means even when it's difficult. 
We have the responsibility to grow as a body of Christ in our willingness to be truth tellers because we understand what the loving thing is. Now, on the other hand, I want to give a, a, a clarification. Speaking the truth does not give you the right or ammo to say whatever it is as long as it is true. Uh, you know those people that say hurtful things and are very unapologetic and they are very proud and they say, but you know what, I'm just telling you the truth. Well, the question that I have for some of you that may fall into that category is, do you think about how your truth telling is done in love? Do you share that truth for the purpose of building up and loving? Or is it just so that you could get that off your chest? My kids often, when they say mean things to me, they'll say things like, Dad, no offense. And whatever they say after that, I don't even want to listen because it's, it's, it's never really good. So I was getting ready for a haircut, and they said, Dad, no offense, but do you really need a haircut? I mean, you're losing so much hair. I'm like, okay, like, how is that helping me? Uh, is that a loving thing? Uh, it's a silly example, but there are many things like that that we do in the context of church where we want to say we are truth tellers, but it's not done in love. Not only telling truth uh, in his heart, but here it's talking about not slandering. Proverbs 11:13. whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. Slander is done by making false and damaging statements about someone, and this is condoned not only from a biblical standpoint, but even in the worldly sense where it's a legal action that could be taken against you. So the seriousness of what David is warning us is for us to think about how is this done in the context of one another here at Hope of Glory. Now, some of you may be thinking, but, you know, we don't really participate in slander, but what about slander in the form of gossip? Now, what is gossip? It's a casual conversation involving others with details that may or may not be true, and this is told in the presence of someone who is not involved in that situation. So we'll hear things like, did you hear about so-and-so? And then we go on and on. Or especially in the Christian circle, we like to gossip in the form of a prayer request, right? We say, can you please pray for this person who is struggling with, and you know, they list out all the sins that shouldn't be shared. Why do we do that? Gossip is a subtle, sneaky form of slander where the things that we say have nothing to do with loving God and loving others. As Brendan Payne, a biblical counselor, uh, said, gossip is incompatible with considering the interest of other people. The very nature of gossip defiles not only the gossiper, but also those who hear it and those whom it is about. As Pastor James Boyce warns the church about this particular topic, and this is what he says, I think more damage has been done to the church and its work gossip, criticism, and slander than by any other sin. So I say, don't do it. Bite your tongue before you criticize another Christian. Speech of a person that God approves is someone who values speaking truth in love, who does not slander. Well, next, conduct of a person that God approves. In verse 3, this is a person who does no evil to his neighbor, who does not take up a reproach against his friend. Not only is it talking about our speech, but in our action, are we conducting ourselves in such a way that there is consistency in the way that we are living our, our lives, in such a way that we are pleasing God in all areas? If I were to ask your family members about how you behave and how your conduct is at home versus at church, will there be any discrepancy? If I were to ask your coworkers about how you are when you go out to your uh, you know, uh, dinner hangouts after work, will there be consistency in the way that you speak and live out your life that is consistent with how you fellowship with one another here at Hope of Glory? I remember my mom gently rebuking me about the tone in which I was talking to her. And whenever she refers to me as Reverend Min, 
uh, I know uh, this is not going to be a pleasant conversation. So she pulls me over one day, and she goes, Moksanim, can I talk to you? So I was embracing myself uh, for a difficult conversation, and she goes, can I just ask you for a favor? When you talk to me, can you watch your tone? And can you talk to me like you talk to your mother-in-law? I was like, oh, okay. She goes, when you talk to me, can you talk to me like you talk to your church members? I'm like, oh, that one hit me. But back on my mind, I was thinking about all the ways in which she was also part of this problem. I'm like, my church members don't nag me. My mother-in-law leaves me alone. So if you do those things, then I will also speak to you that way, right? Obviously, that's not true, and there's no way to justify it. But she was right. There was inconsistency in the way that I was talking, and it was a reflection of my heart in the way that I was conducting myself that was not consistent with what Psalm 15 is picturing for us. And perhaps you resonate with that story because some of us, the way that we conduct ourselves at work may be different than the way that we are at home or at church or with our neighbors or whatnot. Is our conduct lived out in such a way that we're living up to the standard in which it is pleasing God at all times? How do we treat people? Is there a consistency between your private and public life? Is there both purity in your private and in public life? Is who you are when no one's looking the same as when everyone is looking? The conduct of a person that God approves here is someone who is living out his life in all aspects for the glory of God. Well, lastly, value of a person that God approves in verse 4. It says, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. It's referring to the people that you look up to, the heroes and the role models that you have in life. And it's a question that I want us to think about. The people that you look up to and admire to be What is it about them that you love them for? Because here, the picture that David paints for us are those who honor, those who are honored are those who fear the Lord. Meaning they could be successful in the worldly sense, but if they're far from the Lord, it may not be someone who we are to look up to. And uh, Psalm 73 gives us a clear explanation of what David is talking about here in verse 4, where it describes our heart's temptation to envy the arrogant in their prosperity. I don't have the time to uh, go into it in detail, but Psalm 73, 2, 3 says, uh, this is by the psalmist, where he says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here, the psalmist was tempted to define his joy and pleasure in the worldly sense rather than what we find at the end of Psalm 73. Instead of finding our joy and our identity in being with God, it was easy for him to be tempted to try to find that in the prosperity of the the wicked that he saw all around him. But this is how he concludes the chapter in 73, in 25, 26. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Here's a person who values what God values. And what we see here in this text is that we as believers are called to love what God loves. We are to hate what God hates. What we see being important in our lives will reveal what we treasure in life. And it's a reminder for us as God's people that if we want to live a life that is pleasing then our values need to be aligned with the things that he values. And here it tells us what is most honorable, what is noble, is a person who lives their life fearing the Lord. It's not someone who has built a great career, who lives in a nice house, pristine reputation or great wealth, or is the most likable, but someone who loves the Lord with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
Do we look up to and honor those that are quietly serving, secretly, faithfully, consistently loving and serving the Lord? Who do we honor in our lives at this moment? So as we address the question in verse 1, who can dwell in God's presence, David lists out the four areas that are needed in order to be uh, right with God and to dwell in his holy presence. And he ends in verse 5, he who does these things shall never be moved. Let me ask us, as we went through the list in our character, in our speech, in our conduct, in our value, how did we do? Is there anyone in this room who could boldly say that they have done all of those things pretty well in their life? Anybody? I know you guys like to respond. Anybody? I'm so glad nobody raised their hand. It means you are aware of our own need, of our own shortcomings, that you and I fail to live up to what is uh, listed here for us in order for us to be with God. But here's the good news that I want us to end with. And this is a promise that he gives. He who does these things shall never be moved. It's a promise to those that do all these things can never be moved. But if you're like me, as we answered, there's not a single person here in this room who could do all of these things well. So what does that mean for you and I here in this room? Well, when David addressed this psalm in the beginning with the question, who can dwell in God's presence? Notice who he was referring to. It says, O Lord. Now, O Lord is all capital Yahweh. And it's a covenant name of God that was only given to his covenant people. Now, I mentioned I have three boys. And three. My three boys are the only people that could call me dad. Everyone else can call me by any other name, Pastor Min, Min, whatever you want to say. But only three of my kids can call me dad. Why? Because I am their father and they're my kid. And as David is pleading with the Lord, as he's contemplating this question of who can dwell in God's presence, he is confidently addressing this as his covenant son, as he understands that this covenant God has reached out to him. And if you know the Old Testament history, how did the Israelites become their covenant people? It's not because they were great at uh, obeying what God commanded. In fact, even when God rescued them, you saw them complaining and grumbling over and over again, not doing all of the things that God had declared them to do. But that's not why they were his people. Deuteronomy 7, 6, 8, look with me. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasure possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You see, God became their God, and they became his people because God, in his grace and mercy, set his love on them and chose them. Meaning, for us as believers, reading question one is not a question of what can I do to be with God, but because God has already chosen me to be part of his covenant family, it means what David lists out for us is not a list of demands that we have to do in order to be, but it's as a result of what God has already done for us in Christ Jesus. It means that we read Psalm 15 with hope in knowing that this is not the qualification that we need to do in order to become a Christian, but as Christian, we are called to live this out in order to live a life that is pleasing him. You see, Old Covenant saints were always looking forward to the coming Messiah. And we as New Covenant believers look back at what Jesus has accomplished for us 
Because all of Scripture points to Jesus and our need for Jesus as we fall short of all that is required, but also the hope and promise that is in Jesus because Jesus paid the price. So when we read Psalm 15 in light of our our understanding of the whole covenant that we see from the old to the new, it means that we as new covenant believers read this with Jesus in mind and the fact that although we fall short of all of the demands that he gives for us in Psalm 15, Jesus came to pay that price for us. Jesus obeyed what you and I could never do. In order that as we place our faith in him, it means that we also, as we are united to him in his death and resurrection, in life and death, that we also can be like him in his image. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil in Luke 4? Jesus was tempted with all the kingdoms of the world. And yet, instead of taking the bribe that we see here uh, in Psalm 15, Unlike people that take bribe, Jesus walked blameless, and he did the right thing. Instead of finding comfort in the material world, as he was hungry for fasting for 40 days, instead of giving into his flesh, Jesus' response was worse saturated response, where he says, man shall not live by bread alone. And instead of taking matters into his own hands and time, Jesus trusted and obeyed perfectly his father's plan even to his own death in order that 2 Corinthians 5.21 may be true for you and I where it says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Which means hope of glory, the promise and hope is ours in Christ Jesus. Amen. Because Christ obeyed perfectly all of the qualifications that are listed here, it means you and I, as we place our faith in him, in his work, that we can never be shaken. So how can we respond to this amazing news declared for us in the gospel? Two applications for us as we think about what Psalm 15 calls us to do. One, calls us to be thankful as we understand our need for Christ. We could thank him because Jesus fulfilled all of what you and I could never do to become righteous. It means although we fall short of walking blamelessly and doing what is right, because Jesus did it for us, it means that we can also be thankful. But not only being thankful, but we can now, as those that are justified by grace alone, faith alone, and in Christ alone, it means that all of the demands as the gospel uh, requires has been fulfilled, that becomes the very thing for our living. It's our power. Gospel not only saves, but becomes the very source of our power in this holy, righteous living that we are called to live out. Our response isn't, well, Jesus did it all that we couldn't do. Thank God, we'll chill and relax, and that's it. No. Gospel obligates you to call this life of holiness. As Paul Tripp says, you cannot accept the comfort of the gospel without also accepting its call. This grace of the gospel obligates you. And I know in a reform, gospel-centered churches, we don't like that word obligation. But this obligation is not a result of trying to become on our own, on our own merit to become righteous, but this obligation comes as a result of him making us righteous in Christ that you and I can never do on our own. I mean, think about how often uh, there's a call to action here in Psalm 15. Read it over again. It says, who walks who does what is right, who speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander, who does no evil, who does no wrong to his neighbor and friend, who honors, who swears to his own hurt even when it uh, affects him, who does not put out his money at interest, does not take a bribe. All of these things are action-oriented things that we are called to do. But the gospel response and gospel understanding 
as we're rooted in what Christ has done for us, is that we don't do that as a burden that we need to fulfill, but we do it as a result of what he has already done for us in Christ. So it becomes our pursuit, our purpose in life to walk blamelessly for his glory. This is the beautiful balance of the gospel that we see here in this text. Do you want to be stable in your life, as Psalm 15 describes, this person who is never shaken? Well, then you need to have the gospel stance to have one feet on the comfort we find in the gospel as well as the other feet in this call to live our lives for him. So may that be true for us today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives. May we not fall into the error of treating Psalm 15 as a moralizing list of do's and don'ts. And we also don't want to see this as a list of impossible things that we could never measure up to. But instead, may the good news of the gospel comfort and motivate our hearts in such a way that we get to live out our lives with thankfulness and joy in pursuing a life of character, a life of gospel-centered speech, a life of godly conduct and value, that in our joyful obedience that we may enjoy this rich fellowship with God. 1 Peter 1, 13, 16 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. May this be our striving as we understand the beautiful life, joyful, rich life that he has called us to, where we could dwell with God in confidence in knowing that because we have Jesus, we could live for him and for his glory. Let's pray.